Ah, great. Okay. All right, welcome everyone uh, to this evening's Heinz R. Pagels Public Lecture, part of a weekly series of summer lectures brought to you by the Aspen Center for Physics. My name is Josh Freeman. I'm tonight's host and moderator, and I'm currently president of the Aspen Center. And it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Katie Fries. I wanna say a bit about the Physics Center first in non-pandemic times. Uh, the center, which is now in its 60th year, brings to its campus in Aspen about a thousand scientists in roughly equal numbers in the summer and in the winter. Uh, the winter week-long conferences address cutting edge research topics across all branches of physics. While in the summer, physicists come for more extended visits that enable them to contemplate and to collaborate with colleagues from around the world. The bucolic and formal setting of the center lends itself to the incubation of new ideas, and a number of important advances in physics were first made at the center. The center is a nonprofit institution, and our participants are partially supported by grants from the National Science Foundation and from the Simons Foundation, and we gratefully welcome any and all donations. These public lectures were named to honor and in memory of Heinz Pagels, a professor of physics at Rockefeller University, president of the New York Academy of Science, a trustee of the Aspen Institute, and a longtime member of the Aspen Center for Physics, where he served as a participant, as an officer, and a trustee. Heinz was known for his contributions to the physics of elementary particles and cosmology, among others, and for his effective dissemination of scientific knowledge to the public through books and lectures like tonight's. A part-time local resident of Aspen, he died tragically in a climbing accident on Pyramid Peak in 1988. Before we get started, I just wanna request that all participants in this event, as in all of our events at the center, conduct themselves in a manner that's welcoming to all other participants, treating each other with respect and consideration, free from any discrimination or harassment. Creating a supportive environment to enable scientific discourse is really central to our mission at the Aspen Center. For those wishing to ask questions at the end of the talk, I'll ask you then to please use the raise hand function in Zoom and I'll call on you. And we'll have probably about 10 minutes or so for questions at the end. And now to tonight's speaker. I've known Katie Fries since the early 1980s when we were both graduate students at the University of Chicago. Katie received her bachelor's degree from Princeton University and her PhD from Chicago in 1984. And after several postdoctoral positions, went on to faculty positions at MIT and at the University of Michigan, where she spent much of her career. She was director of the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics in Stockholm for three years. And she now holds the Jeff and Gail Kodosky Endowed Chair in Physics at the University of Texas at Austin. Among her honors, Katie was awarded the Lilienfeld Prize of the American Physical Society in 2019, and she was elected last year to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Katie's also a past member of the Aspen Center for Physics. Katie's well known for her many contributions in theoretical astrophysics and cosmology, particularly on the topic of dark matter, only a few of which were done in collaboration with her former graduate student colleague at the University of Chicago. She's the author of the popular book, The Cosmic Cocktail, Three Parts Dark Matter. And that's what she's gonna tell us about tonight. So go ahead, Katie, take it away. Well, Josh, thank you for that introduction. And yeah, Josh and I are known for the work we did on a different topic, inflation. We invented natural inflation together, but that's not today's topic. I'm talking about, as Josh said, the dark matter in the universe. So in this first slide, whoops, I wanna go back to the first one if I can, uh-oh, I can't switch slides. This is not good. Okay, there we go. So in this first slide, if you were to, able to look closer under that umbrella, you would see the night sky in terms of the stars. But that's just a tiny, tiny piece of what's out there. And I'm gonna talk about the other dark side of the universe. Yeah, I'm having trouble switching slides, okay. 
So I promise this is the only equation that I'm going to have in the entire talk, but it's a really, really important one. This was the brilliant insight of Albert Einstein in 1915. These are the equations of relativity. So this is the beginning, the foundations of our field. This is the foundations of relativity and the foundations of cosmology. So on the right-hand side of this equation is all the mass and energy in the universe. And it is connected to the curvature of space with some constants in between. Pictorially, you've probably seen images like this. So here is the Earth and it's warping the space time around it. So the connection between these two things is the major content of this equation. But if we go historically back to 1915, the bizarre thing is how primitive observational astronomy was. Scientists thought there was nothing in the universe beyond our own Milky Way galaxy. So in particular, in the, in the 1700s, Charles Messier was looking for comets and there was some cloudy stuff in front of the comets that was bothering him. So he made a catalog of, he called them nebulae and he, he, he uh, made a catalog of these things. And these are now the things that we call the Messier catalog of galaxies. So he had discovered galaxies with, outside of our Milky Way without realizing it at all. So for example, M31 is Andromeda galaxy, the nearest giant to the Milky Way. So the origins of mo modern cosmology date back to Einstein's relativity. And soon after, other people applied Einstein's theory to the universe as a whole, making some very simple assumptions about the universe. And they discovered there, that there are the possible solutions to the equations imply the universe could be expanding, contracting, or static. Einstein's favorite was a static universe. That's an additional symmetry in time, things are never changing. However, it didn't take long in 1929 for Hubble to prove otherwise. He was using the observatories above Pasadena in the mountains, and he made astonishing discoveries. First, he was able to prove that these other galaxies, that these other objects that we that people thought were inside the Milky Way are just too far away. They have to be, there have to be other galaxies beyond our own. And then he also looked at light from galaxies at various distances away from Earth. And the emissions of these atoms inside the light were known to have a certain wavelength. And what he observed is that the wave, the wavelength that he saw was larger than that. So it's just like if you blew up a balloon and you drew this wave on top of it, as it blows up, the wavelength stretches. And so here's what came out of the galaxy and here's what he saw. Something had stretched those wavelengths and that is the expansion of the universe. So at that point, Einstein abandoned the static universe and was forced to accept that indeed, we live in an expanding universe. So here's a very simple-minded picture of galaxies moving apart from one another. And, uh, and back in those days, astronomers didn't win Nobel prizes, but he did get a stamp. So the Big Bang is the idea that the universe started 14 billion years ago in a hot primordial soup of particles. These elementary particles included quarks and leptons and all kinds of things. And they were initially very, very tightly packed together. It was a very, very hot, densely packed early universe. And then as time goes on, the universe is cooling off and expanding. So these particles are moving farther apart as the universe cools. So that's the basic idea of the Big Bang. And yeah, it was once a theory, it was once a hypothesis, but we know now that the basic picture is really correct. So it's kind of phenomenal to think that throughout history, the ancients have wanted to have some basic understanding of the universe. Every culture had a different creation myth. And as of 100 years ago, we have our, our, we have the Big Bang, which is actually a correct understanding of the beginnings of the universe. Incomplete, but the basics are correct. There's so much data that proves this basic picture of a cooling, expanding universe. But I do want to make a differentiation between what would happen. So here, for example, in this raisin bread model of the universe, you can imagine the raisins are like the galaxies. And as you put this loaf into the oven, you have some dough, you put it in the oven, the, the dough rises. And those raisins move steadily apart from one another. But the difference between the raisin bread and our universe is that this piece of bread has a center. But we believe that our universe does not. 
That's one of the basic assumptions that wherever you go in the universe, if we went to a different galaxy, we would still see all the other galaxies moving apart from us. Well, other, of course, than the ones that are so close that we're going to merge with them eventually. As we look backward in time, all points in the uni uni infinite universe would be getting closer and closer together. And so people have this conception that the, the Big Bang was an explosion from some one point in the universe, but that isn't really the way it works. So if you, if you take all the points in this room, then as you go backwards in time, yeah, sure, that will contract to a single point. But if the universe is infinite, imagine you contract it, you contract it, guess what? It'll still remain infinite as you go, even as we go backwards in time. So the Big Bang is not really a point in space, it is a point in time. So there's no explosion either, but if you want one, put one everywhere. So where do we stand in cosmology today? Well, a lot of big questions were answered at the turn of the millennium. What is the geometry of the universe? What is the total mass and energy content? How old is the universe? The growth of structure, we have a basic understanding of that, but we still don't know how did the universe begin and what is it made of in terms of the matter and energy content. So as far as the geometry of the universe, Back in, in 1930, there were three possible geometries. It could have been with, that we're living on the surface of a sphere or on a saddle or a flat geometry where I've drawn two dimensional analogs of the entire universe. So of course, I'm not talking about flat as in two dimensional. I'm just talking about the geometry being the very ordinary idea that triangles look like this. We, the angles add up to 180 degrees and so on. So here in the flat geometry, if this little creature here sends out two parallel light rays, they remain parallel. But if you had an open geometry, then they would diverge forever. Or in a closed geometry, they would meet up again and then bite him in the, in the behind. So how do we know about the geometry of the universe? This question has been answered and we know it from the early leftover light from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background. It is the size of these hotspots in orange that tell us the geometry of the universe. So if the geometry were flat and light was moving in straight lines, then you're expect, you would expect to see a peak at one angular degree in scale. And what I'm talking about is the size of these yellow regions. If there are one, if when we look out there, there the size is one angular degree, that corresponds to a flat geometry. Yes, indeed, that's what we have, a flat geometry. So this was a, a momentous discovery at around the turn of the millennium. But again, universe having a flat geometry doesn't mean it's two-dimensional. It goes out and you take a cube and go out in all three directions and the shortest distance between two lines, points is a straight line, no curvature, no weird geometry. Now, going back to this equation that I started from, what that tells us if we know the geometry is that we also know the total mass and energy content in, of the universe. And the answer is this number out there in outer space is 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. Here on earth, it's one gram per cubic centimeter. So that is really diffuse. And ask me later, I'll tell you the story about how I tried to explain this to the queen of Sweden and it was a big fiasco. Before I leave this subject though, here we go. Stephen Hawking initials in the cosmic microwave background data. Well, that's a joke, but anyway, so let's move on now to the question what is the universe made of? And here the answer is very surprising. If we take all the objects of our daily experience, our bodies, our, the chairs we're sitting in, the, the cocktails we're drinking, the earth, the sun, everything that we know from our daily experience, all of that is made of atoms. And yet all of that adds up to only 5% of the universe. So that's the big conundrum is what is going on? If we only understand 5%, well, what is the, uh, what is the rest? So if this is a pie, a pizza slice of the universe, this is the ordinary stuff. And here would be the dark matter at 25% and the dark energy at roughly 70%. So this is the, the puzzle. We've got to figure out what this, the rest of this is. So I'm going to focus on the dark matter problem because we know a lot more about that than we do about the dark energy. In fact, this is an 80 year old problem at this point. It dates back to Measurements made by Knut Lundmark in Sweden in 1930 and Fritz Zwicky in 1933. Here's Lundmark and here's Zwicky. So famously, Zwicky was looking at galaxies in the coma cluster. 
there's hundreds of galaxies in there. And he was watching them as they move around the center of the cluster. And he was very, the, the, the bizarre thing was that these galaxies were moving far too rapidly. It, they are being pulled around by mass, but if you look at the stars inside there, the other galaxies would not have been enough to explain these rapid motions. So instead he proposed the idea of dunkle materie, which was the German for dark matter as the explanation. He was a Swiss scientist also working in the same observatories above Pasadena in California. He was also a character. He wrote a book in which he called his colleagues spherical bastards because no matter what direction you look at them from, they're still bastards. So I don't think he would have been the ideal graduate student advisor, but anyway, he was quite brilliant. And by the, by the word dark, the, the, what is meant by that is simply that it doesn't shine, it doesn't give off light, it's not stars. It's, we don't know what it is, but it, we just know it's not giving off light. So there was a lot of debate about the existence of dark matter over the coming of the decades after that. And it was really the work of Vera Rubin that nailed it. So she studied rotation curves of galaxies and found that they're all flat in the 1970s. And this work led to consensus that the dark matter problem is everywhere. I wanna turn now to an analogy, which is the solar system. And this gives the idea, the solar system has nothing to do with proving dark matter exists, but it explains the type of thinking that led to Vera Rubin's discovery. So in this plot, if you, on this axis is the speeds of the planets. And this axis is the distance from the sun. So this would be the sun. And as we move right to the right, you've got these, the radius of the orbits around the sun. And this is a plot of the speeds of the various planets. So we start with the inner planets, um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, da, 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 da. In, I was trying to remove Pluto, but in, in accidentally I added an, another planet. So I've got 10 plotted on here, but I just thought it was funny. So I left it. But the point is that as you move out from the sun, the speeds of the planets drop and they drop in this way that following this formula, I guess I do have another formula, which is that the speed goes at, with the mass. It, depend, it depends on the mass of the sun and of the distance away from the center. So if the sun were four, were four times as massive, then all of these stars would be moving twice as fast. So I, I, this just leads me to some fun story. So Tycho Brahe was, the, was a man who made these study, plan, study these planetary orbits. He lost his nose in a duel and he wore a gold and silver replacement, which sounds pretty horrendous. Then there's another story about him, which is I'd always learned that he died um, at a dinner with the king because you're not supposed to get up before the king does. And so his, he, he uh, drank too much, didn't get up and then later died of a burst bladder. Um, however, then there was some discussion about whether instead it was mercury poisoning by his graduate student, Johannes Kepler, in which case Kepler's laws perhaps should have been Brahe's laws. So believe it or not, about 20 years ago, they dug up his body in Copenhagen and did uh, studies of the mercury, looking for mercury in his mustache hairs. There were still some mustache hairs and guess what? There was no mercury poisoning. So I guess it's true. He died of a burst bladder at a dinner with the king. So I, I've been fortunate enough that I got invited to several Nobel Prize dinners and parties and the, the awards and so on. And I can tell you that it's all true because I did get up to go to the ladies room and I was chastised when I came back by the a woman who's a member of the Nobel committee telling me what, that I really should not have walked past the central table, da, 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 da. So I guess it's true. You're not supposed to get up before the king does. Anyway, so from uh, that, the point of that was to show you what rotation curves are. That was the solar system. And now I want to get back to galaxies where now this is the center of the galaxy and we can look at something very similar. We can look at the speeds of things moving around the center of the galaxy. And again, it is the speed, it's, it's all the mass interior to this orbit that determines its speed. So more stuff inside here means faster orbits. And sure enough, things have faster orbits than you than just based on the, the stellar material inside there. And that's what Vera Rubin saw. So what, this is the same picture I showed you with the solar system. And this is what you would expect, that, it would, that things would move slower as you move away from the center of the galaxy. Those things should move slower. But that's not what happens. Instead, you have these flat rotation curves. 
things are, st are still whizzing, whizzing as you move way out from the center of the galaxy. So the trick is, in addition to the stellar light in the disk, if you add in all this dark matter, well, then it works out. So let's talk about our Milky, our galaxy, the Milky Way. So I've got it behind me, but also this is uh, a picture here where this, the center of the galaxy has a supermassive black hole in there. And I wanted to just say a few words about that because it is the origin of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics awarded to Andrea Getz and Reinhard Genzel for, for the discovery of this supermassive black hole. So this is an artist's rendition of the black hole. So what they did was they studied very carefully the orbits of stars around, around the central black hole. And if you're able to see things close in enough, then you can figure out how big a mass must be in a very tiny region. It has to be a black hole. And they concluded that it was a black hole weighing about 4 million times that of the sun. So back to our picture of the Milky Way, the black hole is obviously not bright, but it's just so you could see it here. Then there's this pinwheel of structure and this, the sun is out along one of these spiral arms. And this whole thing is called the disk of the galaxy. And if, so if we look at it now from the side, there's the disk. And as we move away from the center by about 25,000 light years, there's the sun. And so that's what our Milky Way looks like from the point of view of the stellar content. But what that picture is missing is the dark matter halo. So here's the spiral galaxy and it's got all this dark matter out there that we don't, and that's the thing we're trying to identify. What is that stuff? I do have to make sure and point out supermassive black holes are not the same thing as the dark matter. Every galaxy has a supermassive black hole, but they only make up a tiny fraction of the universe as a whole. So the, the first piece of evidence for dark matter was that things are moving too quickly, these rotation curves found by Vera Rubin. But there's a lot of other evidence as well. One of the other pieces of evidence is Einstein's gravitational lensing. So if you have some dark matter here, no matter what it is, it's not going to give off light it, itself because it's dark matter, but what it does is bend the light that comes from behind it. So a star that's here, the light would get bent in one direction. It would also get bent in the other direction. So from the point of view of your telescope, the, this is what you would see. You'd see two identical images, and the images would be very, very sheared. And using a computer, then you, you, you could then reconstruct how much mass has to be in the middle. There's an app on your phone uh, for gravitational lensing that was invented by a Michigan graduate student. You can actually put in the correct equations and lens yourself more and more. Here is some actual data from Hubble Space Telescope of gravitational lensing. There are distant galaxies that are being lensed by intervening, intervening material between the galaxy and us due to the dark matter that's in between. So here you go, you've got multiple sheared images. It's, there's a lot of information in this, in this picture. And from the shearing of the distant light by the dark matter in between, you can figure out how much dark matter there has to be. So this is from a different object, but this is after doing the computer reconstruction of the dark matter that has to be there. This from, from, from a, a different system, again, data from Hubble Space Telescope. This is actually a cluster of galaxies so there are lots and lots of galaxies in here. This is where the, gal where the galaxies um, are, the mass sticks out. There's a lot of mass there. But then in between the galaxies, there's also a lot of smooth distribution of mass. And so this cluster also has dark matter in it. A third piece of evidence for the existence of dark matter is this is the famous bullet cluster. Here we, we have two clusters that collided and the, there were two different types of behavior when the clusters collided. So the atomic matter got stuck. So it's as though you and I were to collide. Well, we would have electromagnetic interactions. We would have strong interactions, which is what holds your nuclei together. And so you and I would not get past each other. So in the collisions of these two clusters, we can see and it's we, you, we know it's there because it gives off x-rays. This is atomic ordinary gas. On the other hand, again, from lensing, we see there's a it's completely different type of matter. And you can see that in blue. There's additional matter that's out here. I mean, the pink and blue is just for illustrative purposes. But there's an additional piece of matter that did not get stuck. It kept moving. 
And so this completely different behavior of the two types of mass is very strong evidence that indeed we do have two types of matter, the ordinary stuff and then the dark matter. It's also fun to point out that without dark matter, we would not exist. So these, I have a few slides which are from simulations, computer simulations of the formations of galaxies we're going to go way, way back into the very early universe and look at the formation of structure. So initially, dark matter particles were scattered almost uniformly. OK, so in this initial slide, these blue dots are referring to the dark matter. And then as time goes on, the dark matter clumps together more and more and more and makes finally makes galaxies. So. In the simulation, which I'll now move forward in time, you can see the dark matter starting to clump together. And at the end of the simulation, this is what the universe would look like. And it's a very good match to the real world. Um, so it is at the, you have these long filaments of structure of dark matter, and it's at the intersections of these, of these filaments. That's where the galaxies are. And the funny thing is, if you didn't have the dark matter clumping together to make the structures in the first place, and then the ordinary matter falls into it, that the whole picture would fail. If you only had ordinary matter, it wouldn't have made galaxies yet, or it would have, but not recently enough for us to start to exist. So our existence depends on the formation of galaxies by dark matter. So everything I've talked about gives, there's a wide variety of independent indications that dark matter exists. And um, so I haven't talked about all of them. Actually, on the, the one of the most important ones is the cosmic microwave background. I talked about the first peak but it turns out it's from a combination of looking at all of the peaks of this leftover light from the Big Bang that you can see the dark matter really has to be there. You can see again, a separation of the behavior of the ordinary matter and the dark matter. So we had the flat rotation curves, we had lensing, we had uh, the bullet clusters and on here. There's other evidence here from Big Bang nucleus synthesis, but all of this shows you that dark matter has to exist, but we still haven't seen it act in some non-gravitational way so that would tell us what it is, some other force. Okay, so what are the pieces of the pie here? What is the dark matter? Well, what early ideas were, well, maybe it's rocks or gas or dust or something simple, but all of those got ruled out quickly because they would have observational consequences that are not seen. So pretty quickly, people were pushed to exotica. The two candidates that have the strongest theoretical motivation, I'm going to spend most of the time on those and I'll get back to those. But before I do that, oh, neutrinos, that would have been great. They're known to exist. So people were very excited if they had the right, if they were the right mass, and that would have been the dark matter. But the problem is, and this has led to several Nobel Prizes as well, they're too light. The mass just isn't, doesn't come out right. On top of that, because they're so light, they would ruin galaxy formation. So neutrinos don't just, they, they exist, but they cannot be the dark matter. So people are trying all kinds of other candidates. This is a partial list. So sterile neutrinos, that's not the ordinary neutrinos. These are non-standard non model, model particles, and they're still an interesting candidate. And another one I wanted to talk about a little bit is primordial black holes. These would have been born in the universe's first fractions of a second when you had some reg region that had a, a very, very high density and that region would kind of collapse out of the ordinary expansion of the universe. And um, one of the people who worked on this famously is Stephen Hawking. Um, Zeldovich and Novikov did it first. But anyway, so the, there's a lot of resurgence of interest in this subject because of the discovery of, in 2016 of gravitational waves in the LIGO detector. And it is very clear that what LIGO saw was the merging of black holes where each of the black holes weighs 30 times as much as the sun. And so it's kind of interesting because they could, the, and it's, it's not impossible for those to be primordial black holes. And there'd be millions of these between us and the center of the Milky Way. So the LIGO discovery, this was a big deal, led to a, a Nobel Prize in 2017. And so this is in um, Hanford, Washington, this, these two four kilometer arms, but as a gravitational wave comes by, it makes one of these arms longer by a fraction of the size of a proton, okay? And that's because space time stretches in one direction and shrinks in the other. And so that, that, um, would, and that could be due, to, well, it is known to be due to the merging of black holes and these could be primordial black holes that we're that we're observing. 
I want to get now to the what I mentioned said was that were the two best motivated dark matter, matter candidates, and these are WIMPs and axions. And the reason I say they're so well motivated is because they exist already in particle theories for reasons that have nothing to do with cosmology. You don't have to invent them just to solve the dark matter problem. So one of these is axions, which are an, a byproduct of the th in the theory of strong interactions of the solutions of a, of a, of a problem there. And I do have to, they were, their idea was proposed by Steve Weinberg and Frank Wilczek. And I do have to mention that Steve Weinberg just died recently. And he was, he, he was three doors down from me and, and University of Texas, this is him in his office. And he is one of the greatest thinkers in the world and was one of the founders of this standard model of particle physics. So he's a, it's a terrible loss for us and for the world that he's gone. So I, I had to mention that. But the, but the searches for axions certainly go on, not just for the axions I'm I was talking about, but things called axion-like particles. And if you're interested, there's a review by my former postdoc. And so this is, it, axions have two things that describe them, how strongly they interact with photons and their masses. And so look at all these experiments going on. And the yellow lines, that's where the theoretical predictions are. And so this in particular, this one experiment, ADMX, people are very excited, maybe it will discover these axions. And I also wanted to mention what the Aspen organizers, because there is a program right now on dark matter and, and Ben Softy is uh, one of the organizers and he's, he's proposed um, the Abracadabra experiment and also neutron stars as a way to look for um, axions. But that now takes me to the other very well motivated candidate for dark matter, and these are weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. So billions of these things pass through your body every second if they do exist. And that means one, one a day, but somewhere between one a day or one a month hits your body, but it doesn't do any damage. As I said, dark matter does not have strong interactions, does not feel the electromagnetic forces. Yes, they feel gravity. Well, there are four forces fundamental in nature and the other possibility uh, here would be the weak interactions, which are responsible for some types of radioactivity. And so that's the idea of the weakly interacting in the name WIMP. And as far as the massive, well, they weigh between one and 10,000 times as much as protons. So why do we like them so much? Well, we like them because for one thing, you get the right, automatically get the right abundance of them. We know how to calculate how many particles there are of every different type in the early universe and how they interact with each other. We can follow exactly what they're doing in the early universe. And these things are their own anti-partners. And we can figure out how they annihilate among themselves. Whenever they strike one another, they annihilate among themselves. And you can ask how many are left today and the answer comes out about right. So that coincidence with if the, the only piece of physics that we put in is that the annihilation rate is set by the weak interactions. So if the weak force tells you how many of these things should be left today and the answer comes out right. So that's a, a, that's a, that's a powerful theoretical argument for their existence. And the other one is that there are, uh, there are theories, supersymmetry and other theories automatically predict the existence of WIMPs. So in supersymmetry, here's the standard model of particle physics that Steven Weinberg helped to develop. But then if supersymmetry is right, then every one of these particles gets a partner and you put a, this twiddle over the top to symbolize that. Now of all these supersymmetric particles, the heaviest ones decay into lighter ones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to the lightest one. And that one's stable and that could be a dark matter particle. And in fact, it is exactly the type of particle that we're looking for. So that, those are the two reasons that we think the WIMPs are theoretically speaking, very good candidates. And now of course, the thing to do is to look for them. There's a three pronged approach for this. So in this picture, you have two ordinary matter particles coming in. There's a weak, there's the weak force. And then here are the two dark matter particles. So this picture, you could read it from left to right, in which case you're making it. You can either, whoops, you can make it, shake it or break it. And I'm gonna tell you about these three different ways to look at this diagram. And the fourth way is dark stars, my baby. So I'm gonna tell you about that. All right, so the first way to look for WIMPs is to make them. And the way where you would do that would be at the particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. 
Yes, you can ski in these mountains. So what's here you have a ring that is 17 miles around and two proton beams traveling in opposite directions underground, colliding at the locations of the detectors. And in particular, the ones we're interested in here would, would be the Atlas and the CMS detectors where you would be looking for dark matter particles. So just to show a few pictures, uh, Fabiella Gianotti was the spokesperson for the Higgs searches at Atlas and she's now director general at CERN. Here's the Atlas detector, a giant beast with somebody standing there just to show you how the, the incredible human ingenuity that had, had, that had to go into, people call this the cathedrals of physics into building these things. And Peter Higgs at the other one, the CMS detector. So the big discovery of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN was the discovery of the Higgs boson. And so in this picture, you see this bump at 125 times the mass of a proton and that indeed is the discovery of the Higgs boson, which also led to a Nobel Prize. It's been a lot of progress in the fields of cosmology in particular since the turn of the millennium, just staggering when you think where we've gotten in 100 years from knowing nothing to what all the things we know now, and hence all the Nobel Prizes. So, okay, so the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, collider found the Higgs, and one, what is it doing now? Well, it's looking for any un, unknown physics, but one thing in particular would be looking for evidence of supersymmetry. So when you have two protons colliding, you could have a chain of supersymmetric particles, and then the lightest one, which would be the dark matter particle, that would escape detection. So we're looking for signatures of this missing energy as well as signatures of these, um, these pieces along the chain, but nothing discovered yet. Okay, there's a second way to search for these WIMPs, and that is direct, direct detection laboratory experiments deep underground. So he, remember, I was telling you there's billions of these things passing through you every second. The galaxy is made of WIMPs. Well, take advantage of this astrophysical giant number of WIMPs and build a detector made of some nucleus. So the, the WIMP hits it the weak, with the weak force and then bounces off. And there's a little bit of energy deposited in here that you can look for. And the, but the expected count rates are really tiny, one count per kilogram per day. It's really, really tough experiments. Tiny energy deposit, very low count rate. Um, and so this, I'm, I'm gonna tell you about my work and how did, how did I get into this business? Well, it was through David Schramm and he's, he's, he's an old Aspenite. He was chairman of the Aspen Center for Physics. He owns a house in Aspen and sadly at, died at age 52 in a plane crash in between Denver and Aspen. So we miss him terribly, but I can just say if there's any students in the audience, find a great mentor because I sure did. It's, what an amazing, amazing man. We called him Shrambo. He's a Greco-Roman wrestling champ, nearly got, nearly made it to the Olympics. Um, on, on some more Aspen pictures, oh, my other mentor, Michael Turner, former president of Aspen Center for Physics, there he is. And my first time in Aspen, 1983, there's me. There's Michael Turner, David Schramm is here somewhere. Where is he? There he is. And a lot of other really great, smart, wonderful pe people. So that was my introduction to Aspen. And Josh came the following year in, in 1984, Josh Freeman, my host, and, and who introduced me. So back on the subject of what, what, what did I have to do in this start in this WIMP business? Well, I, um, so this is work with David Spurgle and Andre Druckier. I met Andre at a winter school in Jerusalem and then he came back to, to Harvard Center for Astrophysics where I was a postdoc. So I was a student with Dave Schramm in Chicago and then um, postdoc at, at Harvard. And we were among the very first to do these calculations. We were looked at wimps in the galaxy and asked, how, what would they do if they hit a nucleus? How, what kind of scattering would happen? What could you observe? How many would you see and da 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 da. So we did all those calculations and we realized wow, this is something, these are experiments you could build. And so people did build them. And these, in order to do these experiments, you have to be an underground laboratory such as this one. This is the Xenon experiment underneath the Apennine Mountains outside of Rome, because you otherwise you'd be swamped with cosmic rays that would hit your detector. So at this point, this not only did this field get going, but it has really, is gone, it's gone gangbusters. It's all over the world. There are these experiments. These are different laboratories, underground laboratories or underneath mountains and a number of different experiments on all different continents. 
And the one I wanted to say something about was also in the same Grand Sasso tunnel on outside of Rome, the Dama Libra experiment. So I wanted to say something about that. So in our early work, we, we predicted that this, the signal should go up and down with the time of year. We called it annual modulation. And the reason for it is, well, the sun is moving around the center of the galaxy. So from our perspective, it looks like we're moving into a wind of wimps. It's like when you're driving in the rain, it looks like the rain's coming at you. But the, the speed between us and the wimps depends on the time of year because the earth is going around the sun. So the relative velocity between us and the, and the wimps would be the highest, would give us a highest count rate in June and a lower count rate in December. And so it should go up and down with the time of year like this black curve. And their data is laying on top of that. And by the way, there's data, there's, it goes on and on and on. There's data way past 2010, but it's the same thing. They completely agree with our predictions, which is really, really, it's kind of amazing. Uh, 12 sigma means that the odds of this being wrong are like one in, I don't even know how 10 to the what numbers, way, way beyond billion. So they're definitely seeing an annual modulation, but the question is, is it WIMPs or not? And the weird thing is nobody else can think, nobody can think of any other possible explanation. So that would be, that's really good. There's no background that we know that could cause this muons or whatever, we don't know. But on the other hand, here's the downside. They won't release their data to the public, which is a very unusual situation. And other experiments see no signal. Okay, but on the other hand, these other, the other experiments are made of different materials. And so how do you make a comparison? And this leads me to the leaders of three of these experiments. And Juan Colliar had this to say, I'm a Spaniard caught between two Italian women. Rita Bernabe, leader of the Dama experiment um, and principal investigator, Elena Aprile of the Xenon experiment. So as I was saying that um, the experiments don't seem to agree in the following sense, here is the event, number of events in the detector, and, and this is the WIMP mass. What's well, actually the strength of the, of the, of the count, count of the interactions. Dama and Libra, the ones that see the annual modulation are in green, but on the other hand, xenon experiments tell you you have to be below the red and green. So this looks like it's ruled out, but here's the, here's the catch. In order to put everything on the same plot, you have to assume you know all the details of the scattering. You have to know exactly what's going on. And well, we don't, there's a variety of different possibilities. And so this type is called spin independent and sure enough, Dama cannot be spin independent, but maybe it's something else. So as long as these detector materials are different, we don't know what to do. All right, just some fun pictures. Lisa Randall, Elder Aprile, Laura Baudis and me, Rick Gateskull. These are, these are fun field to be in and great conferences. So to test Dama, this unexplained signal is still sitting there after I don't even know how many years. But now the whole trick is to use the same material, the same sodium iodide crystals that Dama did. And there's three experiments that are doing that. So we'll know within the next three to five years because two of them already have, have data, two years of data, three years of data. So the answer is coming. And so I'm really, really eager to know what did Dama see? Did it see dark matter? Or, and if not, I don't know that we'll ever know what it's seen. Now the xenon experiment also has an unexplained signal. It has this little bump here, but that could, that could either be a statistical fluke or it could be uh, some contamination in the detector. So we're still waiting to, and it's very hard to explain this bump. People have, there are some models, but anyway, so that's also, I'm just telling you about the data that we don't know how to explain. So maybe there's something to be something there, you know? So I do also want to mention Kim Body, one of the other, organizers of the workshop that's going on now at Aspen. And she had a very interesting idea about interacting dark matter. Ironically, what if the dark matter has forces that are so strong that it can't even get to the underground detectors? And so she's asking how that would affect the leftover light from the Big Bang and, and on galaxies and so on. And, uh, and she's also an, a new professor at UT Austin where I am. So I'm very glad, very glad to be interacting with her. Okay, new ideas that we've had for dark matter detection. This one's is so fun, I have to mention it. So here you have a nanometer thin layer of gold and there is DNA attached to it. These are strands of DNA hanging down there. And, and yes, you can buy this from, um, I forget the name of the company now. Ah, anyway, a few hundred bucks, you can buy them. They're not clean enough for the detectors that we need for the dark matter experiments. But anyway, so a wimp comes along and it knocks the gold forward into the DNA strands. And 
the gold breaks the DNA, the wimp doesn't break the DNA, the gold breaks the DNA, and then you control DNA, you know, the, the advances in bio biology are tremendous, and so you can control these strands and figure out exactly where the break happened, and then you can go back and reconstruct the track, which means you can figure out where the wimp came from. Oh boy, that makes detection a lot easier. So that's called directional detection. So I think I'll skip ahead now. The, the uh, third prong of, of the WIMP searches is known as indirect detection because you're looking for, not for the dark matter hitting something itself, but the dark matter particles, wherever there's a large abundance of them, as, as the, I mentioned this in the early universe, when there's a lot of them around, they annihilate among themselves. And in, if you look in some region where there's a lot of them bunched together, they're gonna do that. And the products of the annihilation in the end are neutrinos, photons, high energy pho, um, particles of light called gamma rays, or positrons, these are the partners of electrons, the uh, antimatter for electrons. And there are experiments looking for all three of these. So um, looking for neutrinos, this is at the South Pole. These are um, tubes that go, phot phototubes that are, are, go down several kilometers into the ice. This one above the International Space Station, aboard the International Space Station, AMS, is looking for positrons. And, but the one that has the most interesting potential of signal is the Fermi satellite. Here's a picture of it flying around. And it measures high energy photons called gamma rays. And yes, it has something interesting. So here's the gamma ray sky that it seals, that it sees, including these giant gamma ray bubbles. Um, but right smack in the middle is this tiny little region that ha it has too many of these high energy photons called gamma rays coming out. And the question is, are they from dark matter annihilation? So the trick is to subtract off the things you do know about producing gamma rays. And here's the residual excess that we could be from dark matter annihilation. And one of the major players in, this, in these studies is Mariangela Lizanti, who's also an Aspen organizer. Uh, for the for this current dark matter workshop. All right, so we have some unexplained signals in Daman and Xenon and in the Fermi gamma ray excess from the galactic center, but we don't know if any of them are real. And what we'd like to do is also imagine if, the, if in the theories we could explain these things with a, with a single particle, that would be great. So a lot of um, interesting studies going on to figure out what's going on here. Oh good, I do have some time to get to my baby, which is dark stars. The idea that dark matter annihilation, the same annihilation I've been talking about, can power the first stars. So this is an idea that I had together with Doug Spoliar and Paolo Gondolo, and we called it dark stars before we knew about the movie that predated us. But so the idea is that the very first stars to form in the history of the universe, and that's when the universe was only 200 million years old compared to today, it's 14 billion. The, these very first stars could be powered by dark matter annihilation and have no fusion at all going on in there. So these, these things are made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang, and dark matter constitutes less than 0.1% of the mass of the star. So they're ordinary matter, but they're powered by dark matter. And so the way it happens is that very, very early on, you have a collapsing cloud of hydrogen, but it's collapsing right where there's a lot of dark matter. And so when it gets dense enough and it pulls in the dark matter, then dark matter annihilation kicks in and the annihilation products of the dark matter get stuck in this collapsing cloud and turn it into a star. And these things are very weird. They are about um, 10 times in the radius is 10 times the distance between the earth and the sun. And they're, they're so these big puffy things with dark matter heating throughout and way too cool for any fusion to be going on. So they start out weighing about as much as, as the sun, but then they can accrete, they grow, 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 and they can reach 10 million times the mass of the sun. And they could be um, a billion times as bright as the sun, 10 billion times as bright as the sun really. And if that's true, then the next version of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope, it's called the James Webb Space Telescope, it's launching soon. The James Webb, the JWST, should be able to see the largest of them. So we have to be lucky that some of them grow to be big enough that you, they could be seen by the James Webb. That would be just monumental. If you, that, what a way to discover dark matter. Then the other interesting things is that, is that once the dark matter runs out, eventually the dark stars 
whether or not they have a fusion phase will collapse to big black holes. And that, that would be a really way, interesting way to explain the origin of supermassive black holes. There, there's even this just really 10 billion solar mass black holes very, very early in the history of the universe. If we can give seeds of, of, of millions of solar mass black holes, then maybe we could explain where these big black holes come from and also the ones at galactic centers. So there's all these different approaches to looking for this WIMP dark matter that I talked about, the underground laboratories, the indirect detection collider searches, or looking for dark stars. Uh, I wanted to mention our, our other um, Aspen organizer for this workshop, and that's Tian Tian Yu, and she's looking for less massive dark matter particles that are lighter than the ones I've been talking about. Remember that WIMPs are in mass between the mass of a proton and 10,000 times as much. But it's possible that there's something else called light dark matter that goes down to a billionth the mass of the proton. And there's an experiment called Sensei, um, which is uh, gearing up to look for this type of dark matter. And if you get light enough, then it's called fuzzy dark matter, acts more like a wave than a particle. So there's a lot, there's a there's a lot, a variety of things that people are working on. Whoops. Ah, sorry. And I want to return at the very last few, last few minutes of my talk to, well, that we've talked about the dark matter problem. And the nice thing is that we know dark matter exists. There's evidence here, there, and everywhere. It's just a, a, and, and if the rest of the puzzle piece, piece fix, fits together, then we should have dark energy too. But dark matter, we can see it, what it's doing to things. So we know a lot about it. And so we think it's not crazy that it could be some new kind of fundamental particle and we know how to look for it. So this is a, sort of well-defined problem. And remember that the definition of matter for both of these things is that it feels gravitational attraction. So whenever there's ma matter, particles attract one another, always, even antimatter also, all of that stuff is gravitationally attractive. The, so the difference between matter here and the, and the dark energy is that there's something else going on that is causing has a repulsive behavior. So dark energy has the opposite behavior. It's somehow causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And that is something we do not understand at all. The dark matter, we know what's going on to, to a pretty good degree, but dark energy, we're quite lost. It's a very tough problem, both observationally and theoretically. So I had the same diagram before, but these galaxies are not just moving apart, but they're not just expanding, but they're accelerating apart from one another. Very weird. Um, I guess I should have said from the beginning, obviously, if, if you have two neighboring galaxies, their gravitational attraction will make them get to collapse together and that wins over the expansion. But on the average, if you look far enough out, this is what's going on. So I'm going to end with a joke. So there, this was at the World Science Festival in New York in 2011. There were three of us that were talking about dark matter on this panel and these three people talking about dark energy on this panel, and there's Michael Turner. And I said, the only thing that we, the, there's only one true thing we really know about dark energy. And so I made the following statement. And I leave it, I, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, I think this was, this is the origin of um, the, uh, well, the, the, my original title for the talk, the cosmic cocktail, three parts dark matter. If you wanna make a drink, of the cosmos. If you had a 10 ounce drink, then you'd have, well, 2.5 ounces of dark matter, seven ounces of dark energy. And yes, as I was saying, supermassive black holes is almost nothing, a millionth of an ounce. But so you put all these pieces together, stars, neutrinos, and so on and so forth. And then the whole thing in the early universe was shaken of all these particles hitting one another like crazy and the secret ingredient, dark matter. So I think that is where I will stop and take some questions. Great, thanks. Thanks, Katie, for that great talk. Um, let's uh, give Katie at least a virtual, if not real, <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. And, um, we can please use the raise hand function. Uh, so Josh, do you think I should stop sharing at this point or just leave it up in case of questions? Yeah, if there's a question that maybe refers back to a slide. Okay. Okay, great. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand uh, feature on Zoom and we'll call on you. Uh, so I see Barbara has a, a hand raised. 
Michael, Barbara's, wait a minute. Okay. okay. This is Michael, Barbara's husband. And I have to apologize for uh, having to step out during part of the lecture, but I'd love to know more about um, dark matter annihilation and uh, what is that phenomenon? Um, how are these particles annihilating one another? Is it analogous to antimatter annihilation? Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. So um, I'll just say a few words about antimatter. So we know that for every particle, there is an, an antiparticle. So for example, for the proton, there's the antiproton. For the case of the electron, it's called a positron. And they have exactly all the same properties, sorry, exactly the, all the opposite properties of one another, like the electron is negatively charged, the positron is positively charged. They have the same mass and spin, but everything else is opposite. So if a proton and an antiproton hit each other, they annihilate and turn into something else. So there are, so many of these WIMPs, the idea is that, that they are their own antiparticles. So imagine the, the proton was its own antiparticle and then two of them, would, whenever they found each other, they would just turn into something else. Okay, another question from George. Hey. Sorry. Um, yeah, question on the uh, WIMP wind you mentioned. Um, where does it come from and uh, does it have a direction or and or velocity? Yeah, so the WIMPs themselves are moving in random directions in the galaxy. There's no, there's no preferred direction, okay? But it is the, the sun is moving around the center of the galaxy. So it's the sun that creates the illusion of a WIMP wind. So the analogy that I was saying, think about it is like the, the rain is coming down, but when you're driving into it, it looks like it's coming at you. So it's more like that. It's because it's, it's the sun that's moving into the, the, the wimps that makes it look like the wimps are coming at us. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Connor has a question. Hi, yes, uh, going back all the way to the beginning, I think this is something I've always, um, uh, not quite understood. How do you know that something is being red shifted? Like, how can you be certain that it's not just a little bit more red than something else? Um, yeah. So that's, that is right back. That's all. Okay. I'm not going to try to get there. It's too far back, <laughs> but the, so let's say there is, there's, there's some, there's some atom. Okay. And there's a transition inside that atom and it has a very well-known wavelength. So we know exactly what that atom is doing. So it goes from a higher energy to a lower energy state. And there's a wavelength that comes out. I'm just gonna make it up a thousand angstroms. Okay, that's the wavelength of light that comes out of that atom. But now let's say I measure it and I measure it to be um, three times that. So that shift in wavelength between what, what came, we know what came out of the star, because we, we know what things are inside the star, we know what the atoms are like. And then you measure the wavelength of it and it's, it's different by, it's three times as long. That means that's how much the universe expanded in that period. So then you can go back. And so that, that enables you to say how far back in time that light was emitted. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. So you're saying um, since all the stars are the same, or at least certain stars are the same, or they are, they would be within a certain possible range of materials. Um, if yeah, this assumes different. you know what the material is exactly, but you do. Yeah. So okay. So there is the potential that maybe there's a star out there that's not quite what we think it is that we think is redshifted, but really isn't. Is that? Okay, you have to, uh, let me just tell you one thing. I'm not an observer, but they sure seem to think they know what they're doing. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Thank and I, I trust them. Yeah, so the other thing that helps white, is that- white dwarfs, have, white dwarfs have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in them. Um, and it, you know, so for example, you know what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I could just add that when you're looking at distant galaxies, you, you typically see multiple uh, emission or absorption lines. And so it's both the, uh, the, the ratio, it's both the shift, you know, they both have to be shifted by the same redshift. Uh, and uh, so that, that gives you, that helps you identify what kind of 
um, elements uh, are giving rise to these lines as well when you see multiple lines. Gotcha. So like as, um, what's it, the principle of spectroscopy. So you're saying exactly. it's redshift. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So if you shift it back, that's what that element would be. Yes, okay. Thank you. yes, yes. You take the spectrum of some star and you know what that spectrum should be, and but the whole thing is shifted. So it's not just one line. Perfect. That makes a lot more sense. Thank so that you. Helps. Okay, thank you, Josh. That was very helpful. Uh, so there's a question from Steve in the chat. Yes, if we can we tell if dark matter is evenly distributed or can it be traced to individual points that we just can't see? Well, we know it's not individually distributed because um, I don't know if you remember I showed the picture of the formation of galaxies. So it used to be evenly distributed, almost, not quite. We think that's because of inflation at, right after the Big Bang. We think that some regions had a little extra matter compared to others, and those regions then accumulated more and more matter, da 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 da, da and they ended up clumping together. First, you make smaller objects, they get, then they clump together to make bigger ones. Eventually you get galaxies, which later on will clump together to make clusters. So as time goes on, dark matter, because of the gravity, it, it clumps into larger and larger objects as time goes on. Great, and I'm gonna stick with the chat for the next one. Uh, looks like Carl's been reading, uh, reading ahead. So he asks, have you given any thought to the possibility that the dark matter is a condensate of some sort. Yes, I haven't, but people do, absolutely. So there's, for example, if things are, um, if, there's, if, there's, if there's something called, there, there's scalar field dark matter. So if things are scalars, then they can be a Bose-Einstein condens condensate. That means you can have tons and tons of them packed into very, the, Ah, you all, you, you've heard about the Pauli exclusion principle. You can only have one electron in, in, a, in a given state. But, but if instead you have scalar fields, a different kind of spin, they can clump together into things that are called condensates. And that is definite, that's definitely an area of interest. And that's, for example, the fuzzy dark matter. That would be one of the explanations for the fuzzy dark matter. It's very, very stuff that it's, it, it behaves as a condensate, but it, in the end, it acts like it's light, very light, the very light particles. Okay, and since you're still on the, the SUSY slide here, Charlie asks, how many of the SUSY particles have been experimentally verified to exist? Zero, it's awful. <laughs> so the best way to look for them, one of the, the things, that's one of the things the Large Hadron Collider was supposed to find, they haven't seen them, but we always knew that, you know, it's not that easy. So we might have to build an accelerator that's higher energy. We might have to, the LHC is only, only applies to, it, it can't find all possible supersymmetric particles. So um, you might have to build supplementary experimental um, pieces of experiment of experiment to look for them. And so parallel with that, of course, are these other searches I was talking about and that could be finding supersymmetry too. But we knew even before the LHC turned on that it might not have a sensitivity to find it. So it has not been found, very sad. Okay, let's go to a different slide. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going back to the, uh, the raised hand. So Barbara, I don't know if that's a new raised hand or if you just didn't take your hand down. It's a new uh, raised hand. And okay, go ahead. It's me again. I guess I have two questions. Does the standard model allow for a particle to be its own antiparticle? And uh, if WIMPs are their own antiparticle, how come they're still around? Are there collisions just that infrequent? Okay, so in the early universe, the WIMPs were annihilating like crazy. So you're dead on, that was going on. However, as the universe expanded enough, then they, were, they, they weren't able to find each other anymore. So they're, they, they're still there, they just don't hit each other often enough to annihilate very much. Now, the exception to that is, for example, at the center of the galaxy where you have a lot more, there's a lot more dark matter at the center of the galaxy than there is out here. And so if you're, if you're looking in it, so that's where you might have a lot of annihilation still going on. And that's what this um, Fermi satellite might be seeing. Although, as I said, there's alternative explanations. It could be pulsars, it could be, so we will, that, you know, that's a really tough one because we don't know everything that exists at the center of the galaxy. It's hard to prove what you're seeing, but it could be. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, John Close, who looks like he's on the soccer pitch, has a hand raised. 
Hi. Um, I was super excited um, about the WIMP detectors and particularly that result you showed with the annual periodicity in, in only one of those detectors. And um, I was wondering if you took the hypothesis that they were completely right and they had in fact discovered WIMPs and all the other guys were completely wrong and their experiments were incapable of discovering WIMPs for some reason, could you sort of infer some problem? Hold on, you know what? They might just be seeing that the other experiments are made of different materials. So they yeah. don't have to be wrong. They just might not be sensitive to the same object. But anyway, if you, but no, no, but that was, that's where I'm going. Because if you've got sodium iodide detectors, what's that measuring that the other detectors aren't measuring? Yeah, that's what we're trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly very good question. So um, sort of in this in the standard model of of we have certain we call them operators of that connect the the would connect the wimps with the ordinary matter okay and so people have tried every possible operator on the and so there that's one one avenue doesn't seem to work that well however then there's another avenue which is maybe there's something about the nuclear physics that we don't understand nuclei are very complicated objects and so it's not just the particle physics and the microscopic on well, the most microscopic level it could be the nuclear physics so you know, you're, this is this is the big question: is if what what is going on here? We do we we have not figured it out. Wow, but but people are confident enough to build brand new experiments with it, though. Yes, I guess well, so. I don't know if confident enough is the right thing to say. People want to know, you know. I, I mean, even though I was the per, what, I was on the paper that first proposed this idea. I never believed that Dama had had anything. Okay, you know when I started really paying attention was when Frank Calaprice at Princeton, who was a very very accuracy kind of um, that he's an experimentalist and he's gone after very very high precision experiments on t time violation, this kind of stuff. He says, you know, we have to take this seriously. We have to go build a detector of the same material. We have to test this. And I was like, oh my god, it might actually might be right. You know. So you've got the really the really careful experimentalist curious enough to go test it now. That's what's going on. That's cool. Thank you very much. Okay, last question by Connor. Yes, um, I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, is it possible to know if dark matter uh, kind of behaves or uh, obeys the laws of quantum mechanics? Um, well, yeah, everything obeys the laws of quantum mechanics. <laughs> so. Okay, so it would obey just like any other particle yes. in the state of mind. Okay. Yeah. So, for so example, you can figure out you can't, and the, the kinds we're talking about, you can't pack too many of them into too small a space because then you violate the uncertainty principle or this kind of stuff. That's certainly, yeah, all that stuff holds up if they're, they're, if they're a certain type of dark matter like the WIMPs. So then you could like you could entangle it or something like that and detect it like that or oh wow okay that's that's uh, not something that I've thought about I turned this question Probably over for a good reason <laughs> I was going to hand this one off to Josh wish him luck with it <laughs> uh, well I think actually we are out of time so I'm going to duck <laughs> that one completely. Oh, you get to talk. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> but uh, great questions and uh, a great uh, a great lecture. Uh, so let's thank Katie again. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you uh, telling us all about dark matter and appreciate everyone who is uh, able to join. A reminder that uh, this is a, a weekly series that goes through uh, through this month. Uh, this time, uh, every Thursday at this time at the Aspen Center for Physics. Uh, so we invite you uh, to join uh, next week. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, I know everybody zoomed out. So thank you for coming. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs>